three, two. Oh, and welcome. She'd like to thank the Academy <laughs> and her mother and father. Thank you, and thank the, you. <laughs> and tech support. <laughs> This page right here is a brand new page that I just finished drawing yesterday. So I did, um, I did spend a lot of time on it and I did proofread it as much as I could, but normally I would spend a little bit longer working on a coloring page. So I do apologize in advance if you guys find any imperfections or artifacts in it as you're coloring, which may happen, but I hope won't. I scanned it like a million times and, and I think it's presentable enough for us to play with. This page comes as a request from our last week's event finalists, Helma and Mineke. Their prize for winning the coloring event was to request um, any topic uh, for the following week. And they requested small light sources, very specifically either candles or lanterns. So I got a little carried away. I couldn't do just one candle or just one lantern. So I put a whole bunch of different lanterns in here that we will play with. Of course, we have the biggest one that the girl is holding. And then we have this whole array of tiny lanterns that are all different sizes and, and shapes. And then these guys back here. So we can make um, each of these lights a different color and different intensity. So we can see how the light falls on the girl and the puppy dog. So. Oh, and the girl, by the way, she's the same character that I've created um, a while ago for my book. Which book was this? For my book, Circus, Knights and Mare Circus. She was the lion tamer and she was drawn in a more cartoony style back then. I went with a little bit more realism on her face, a little bit more detail, um, but she is the same character. I really like her. So she returns and now she's going to a new year's party with her dog who is dressed as a dragon and she has all of her good luck lanterns the reason that i went with chinese lanterns is because they are uh, they're used for for good luck and for celebrating a new beginning and a brighter future and dragons are also a symbol of good luck in in chinese culture i just find the whole culture so beautiful and and i love dragons and i love lanterns so it just all kind of fell together this page is called um, Little Light of Hope. And I thought that in this time of darkness, we could all use a little hope. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it, I don't actually know how it goes. There, there's some things that we need to get straight out of the way. There are two ways to approach this. One, you can do it on toned paper, like what I'm doing. I chose brown toned paper, very light, very light, not dark brown, just barely tanned. Or you can do it on white. And what we'll do today is we'll establish the light areas and we'll start establishing the shadows. So for the light part, I'm using white charcoal. You can also use white pencils if you're working on 10 tone paper. The Prismacolor white is great. It works just as well as white charcoal. And unlike white charcoal, you can use it at the end of your coloring as well to adjust some things. Whereas with white charcoal, you have to start with it and then the pencils go over it, but it doesn't go over colored pencils. So keep that in mind. And then for my shadows, I will start uh, to introduce the base shadows with a basic middle brown. And so that I drive the point of the tools don't really matter home yet again. Um, I selected a whole bunch of them depending on which brand you have. This is just a small example of the colors that you can use. Anything in like the middle sepia and the chestnut family will work just fine. So I have even, I have a watercolor pencil here that's a middle brown, that would be fun, but I won't be using it today because I tend to lick them and that's just not very attractive. <laughs> um, this rattlesnake from uh, Black Widows. Um, the other one from Black Widows that will work fine is cinnamon. From Prismacolor, I have burnt ochre and, um, and burnt ochre. Burnt ochre and burnt ochre, there you go. So let me just explain one thing about what I'm doing here. Most of these white areas that I'm marking up will actually have color over them eventually. We will add the actual glow of the lanterns as the last part of this coloring. But for now, we're marking them with white so that we know which areas are lit. And if you're working on white paper, you should be coloring the, the rest of this in your pale brown. And this painting, painting <laughs> piece, this coloring page, will be all about layering. 
This isn't about you have to pick the right color to go from the edge of the shoulder to the edge of the sleeve. Um, you have to think of it more in terms of the complete structure. And with layers, you can, you can have better control um, of the whole situation and you can add your darker areas and make them more intense as time goes on. This will take several days. This, this will take me several days. And, and if you guys are patient with me and don't jump ahead and are coloring along, uh, along um, I hope that, um, that you will follow the steps that I'm proposing and see if they work for you. And of course, if you're, if you're inventing something along the way that is, that is your own technique, please, by all means, um, do what you're comfortable with or, or what you think will work better. Um, so again, I'm adding white everywhere, even to the face, even to the clothes, even though her robe will probably be red. Someone requested that it be red and jade in color, so I will go with those. Um, but regardless of what my final colors will be, this is only about light and shadow right now. So don't worry about going over the areas that you know will be a different color in the end. This is about light and shadow only right now. So go over all the little details. And also because most of her will be in the dark, a lot of this detail will be lost as well. So like most of her clothes will not have the, you won't see all the details on the, of the patterns. We will color over them. All the little details in the hair will probably just end up being black because we want to convey um, light in the dark. Right now, I am pretty much making a grayscale um, coloring. Well, not grayscale, but sepia scale, um, but monochromatic. I'm just going from brown to white. And that's a very good strategy for working with um, high contrast pictures where we have um, a small light in the dark. Remember when we did the, um, the glowing fireplace for Christmas? Yeah. And I colored everything with watercolors. It was yeah. just like a brown color and then we added all the detail over it. We're kind of going for the same thing. So actually working with watercolors or pastels here would be a good idea if you want to just cover everything with a single um, middle brown tone. That will be faster, certainly. <laughs> and, um, and it will establish that shadow nicely. So yes, right now we're not distinguishing between the colors of objects at all. I'm using the same brown on her face, on her coat, on her dog, on her hair, on everything. Everything that's in shadow is being done in brown. Again, I'm working with only two colors, white and brown for now. Um, I will add more of the brown to the, to the background. The inside of the round window will be darker brown. And then I will add a little bit of brown here on the sides as well. So everything that's not white will be some shade of brown, but the same, um, the same pencil, only two colors to start with. First, I wanted to talk to you about my favorite tool, white charcoal. Wait, this is a family show. Oh, he's a white charcoal already. Never mind. <laughs> oh my God. I live with a child. <laughs> white charcoal. A bunch of you are asking me questions about this magical, mysterious tool and how to use it and what it does and what You're the deal is. White charcoal, right? I am still talking about white charcoal. Because okay. they can ask you about the other things too, Un just not on the show. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. He's 12. Uh, so the paper that I use is this textured, lightly, very lightly textured um, brown toned paper or gray toned paper. And I use white charcoal um, on it directly. The trick to using white charcoal successfully on toned paper is that you start with it. I think that uh, I am getting reports from some of you that it works beautifully. And I've seen pictures of some of your works in progress where it's clearly super white, like white paint or white out. And then others are reporting that it barely leaves any trace on the paper at all, which is very confusing because if you are actually using the General's brand white charcoal, it should stay on any surface as long as the surface is clean. However, if you try to add it over pencil marks, it won't work. So I suspect that's the problem um, with, with using it for some of you. Either that or, or you are applying it way too lightly. Don't be afraid of, of applying it with a little bit more pressure. You don't need to grind it, um, but you know, a healthy amount of pressure like you would color with a regular pencil. And then of course, I like to use my Q-tip to, to blend it even further and to make it stay on the paper nicely. Like it's not powdery at all. Like I'm actually smearing the paper. Confirm that I'm actually touching the paper. 
I am here to confirm that the paper is actually being touched. <laughs> and nothing, no like powder. An, like an expert witness in Nothing. Case. Yes, exactly. Yes, it's exactly Honor. like that. The she paper touched the paper. Is being touched. I brought you some examples of the things that we've colored together where I used white charcoal. This is a, a grayscale sketch that I did for um, a study on fabrics that we did on Christmas. And this is only white charcoal and black charcoal. So you can see how white it is. It's, it's certainly not as pure white as, as white paper, but it's really close. And if you don't use a Q-tip, if you just apply more um, of the charcoal, you can get proper pure white without a lot of pressure. This is a very old sketch that I did also using white just as a light highlight. Like I barely applied it here at all, but you can see that it makes a huge difference. This is from an old tutorial of mine on silver. Again, this part right here is only white charcoal. There's no paint here or anything. That is ridiculous. I'm looking at that on the camera. <laughs> Does it look nice? It looks like silver reflectiveness. That's that's, a, that's, that's a, amazing. One of my older tutorials, you guys can find it if you if you go to my main channel and just, just scrub through the older videos, you'll find this. It's on the cover. Uh, that was a fun one. And then of course, the, the white roses that we did as a mm, tutorial. I remember that. This, this is on tan paper. And you can see why I like gray paper um, for my effects, why I generally prefer gray paper for more dramatic effects, because white does stay better on gray paper than it does on tan. But tan has its privileges because it, the tan color shows through and it becomes softer and, and more natural. Like for roses, the tan color is really nice because it's more organic. And for something like this, gray is good because it's just a, a grayscale study. Go, go home and, and practice. <laughs> take this knowledge, take your white charcoals and, and, and go make things white on gray and, um, and report back to me and let me know how it went. Let me know if these tips were helpful. A lot of you were asking about how to achieve this same effect with the white glow and the brown pencil. We only used two colors yesterday, a brown pencil and white charcoal. Starting with white charcoal and then continuing with the brown pencil. You were asking me how to do the same thing on white paper. So this morning I made a small version of this page. I cut out just the, just the circle and printed it on white paper and colored it on white paper without using white charcoal, just with pencils and I recorded it for you. So we'll play that clip for you now and I will talk over it explaining what was happening there. So I took the same pencil, the same brown pencil that I used on the, I keep, I keep trying to put my hand on the coloring, but that's not the screen <laughs> you're looking at. <laughs> I took the same pencil, which is a cinnamon from the Black Widow pencil set. And it's the same one that I used on the brown toned paper, except now I'm applying it to white paper. And the procedure is exactly the same, um, except I didn't need to mark the parts that were white with white charcoal because the paper is already white. So I can imagine where the white highlights will go. And in this particular case, I, I didn't even have to do a lot of imagining. I just copied what I see on, um, on my paper on the left on the thing that, that I already completed. Well, at least at the, at the stage that it was completed. So I had a reference to look through. A few of you came back with some interesting comments saying that you use white charcoal on white paper anyway, because white paper comes in different tones of white. Sometimes it's a little bit off white. Sometimes it's a little bit cream colored. So you can still see the white charcoal in it, just not as dramatically as you would on toned paper. And even if it doesn't show very obviously in tone difference, you can see it in texture difference. So for your own personal reference, uh, it may be a good idea to apply white charcoal to white paper as well, just so that you know exactly where the light will fall. And of course, if you're working from a reference photo or um, a reference uh, coloring, like for instance, once I finish this, if you want to do, I, I keep gesturing at my paper again. <laughs> Once I finish this coloring, you may wish to look over the videos again or um, reference my finished piece so that you already know where all the light goes and apply your uh, light and shading in, that, in those areas. So for me, as you can see, I, I didn't use white charcoal on white paper. I only used the, the brown color to add my shadows. And that's your standard way of coloring. That's how you would approach any type of drawing or coloring, if you're doing it on white paper, you start with your shadows and you leave the parts that will be lit 
uncolored. And of course, if you go over the top and you color too much, if you like, um, or at the end, if you look at the finished product and it seems like uh, there should be a lighter area somewhere, you can use other things to lighten that area up. For instance, with a lot of pencil brands, you can use lighter colors over darker colors, like Prisma colors. I love Prisma colors for that reason. You can always take your white or, or cream colors and just add them over the dark tones and they work kind of like chalk pastels. You can take chalk pastels and add them over your, over your dark pencil coloring and lighten those areas up that way. Um, um, acrylic paint also works really well. I often use acrylic paint for lighter highlights at the end because it's so easy and so fast and you can, you can use actual brush strokes and it's a lot faster. Um, and finally, you can use your white gel pens with, uh, with a Q-tip smudging trick to add little highlights. I wouldn't recommend the pen for, for large areas, like that whole area on her, um, on her coat is too large to do with a gel pen. Um, but for instance, little highlights on the tip of her nose or the, the roundness of her cheek or her eyelids, you can absolutely use a white gel pen at the end and just smudge it a little bit. And of course, we'll get to the final touches when we're closer to finishing the piece. For now, I just want you to see how applying the shadows uh, without having a white reference, it, nothing really changes. It's the same exact thing. But you can also see that it's taking a lot longer. I mean, this is, this is a time lapse. This is four times the speed. Uh, so it, it looks really fast. But uh, in, in reality, I was able to compare how, how quickly I, I established my shadows in the first version that we did together yesterday versus how much shadow I have to use here. Because on tan-toned paper, I'm using the background color as, as my base already. I don't have to add that much actual pencil pigment. I, I'm just adding a little bit to make it darker. Uh, whereas with pencils, I, with pencils on white paper, I have to actually keep adding the pigment and keep adding the pigment and it's a lot of layering. And especially with compositions where we're dealing with small light sources like candles and lanterns, the trick is to have the rest of the page completely dark like nearly black and we'll, we'll get there. We'll keep adding layer after layer and this page will be extremely dark in the end with just the, the little lights. Okay, so um, here I, I paused and I added more darkness to my tan toned paper page. I added the dark area behind the girl. So after I did that, I went back to my white paper coloring and I made the background darker as well so that I can match it. You can also see how the color turns out a little bit different. Even though I'm using the same exact pencil, it looks more reddish on white paper. Like that's its actual true color. That's what it was designed to look like. Whereas on tan paper, because I'm not applying that much color and it's just the first layer and it's a very thin layer, you can see a lot of the paper color coming through, which in this case is desirable. I really like it because it creates, it introduces that third color, which allows for the, the soft golden gradient that makes it look like the lanterns are actually glowing um, because you get that nice transition from, uh, from the brown with the pencil marks with a little bit of an underspill of the paper color and then to the white that you have. So it looks a little bit more dynamic. Whereas with white paper, I don't get that effect with just one pencil. I can get that same exact effect, absolutely, but it will take longer and I will have to introduce at least two other colors. I would need to, to introduce something a little bit on the grayish side, like a dark sepia color and something on the mustard side, like, a, um, oh God, I can't remember any of the Black Widow's funky names. It was like a stink bug and mustard face or something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they're, they're this, these beautiful, not straight up yellow colors, but like a little bit greenish mustard colors. They're very, very beautiful golden colors. And depending on what kind of pencils you have, um, you, would, you would build them one on top of the other to create the exact effect that you want. So, ta-da! And now we're back to the to where I left off this morning and I hope that was helpful. I hope that was a good demonstration of how you can really achieve the same effect on white paper. It just takes a little bit longer. I will work on the <laughs> I will work on this lantern today 
and I will make it yellow. For my yellows, I, I just want to demonstrate that you can use any color yellow at all that you have. I have six selected here that are mostly lemon and sunshine yellows from different sets. I have Lyris, Prismacolors, and Black Widows. Um, I will be working with a Lyra. This is the chartreuse color that I really like. Uh, Kat says, I was for some reason expecting the lantern will be red. Is that the case or will it remain yellow? Uh, this lantern will remain yellow. You were um, logically expecting the lantern to be red because a lot of Chinese lanterns because are... Because you were wrong. <laughs> because you were wrong. Because a lot of Chinese lanterns are red, but they don't have to be. Actually, a lot of the paper lanterns, especially the ones that the kids use for the New Year celebrations, are just yellow paper. So I want this one to be yellow or orange, and then we'll use, we'll have bright red ones and purple ones and green ones um, in this whole bunch of little ones over here. And also her dress is gonna be red, so I don't wanna have too much red here. In the end, I have a vision that this whole page will be very dark and, and rich with uh, purple and red and like really deep burgundies. And this single center lantern will be bright yellow. Uh, yesterday we colored the main lantern in yellow and today our main objective is to start building up more darkness behind the girl and also to start adding color to her coat and if we have time to her hair. So the main colors that I'll be working with today are really dark browns and any kind of a really dark brown will work regardless of what kind of pencil set you have. I have here a bunch of Black Widows, some Liras and a Prismacolor. My main choices here are different variations of a dark sepia color. So any kind of a dark brown color. I would pick three different tones at least um, and play around with, um, with how dark you can get um, the background to be. And also to add a little bit of variation so that it's not all the same dark brown, but you know, try to add a slightly different color to the hair than you do to the background, for instance. And I will also be using two Prisma colors um, a dark purple and a crimson red. And we already marked our areas that will be lit by the lanterns and we'll add that yellow glow at the very end once we've established all the darkness. So today I'm just going to be building up the dark background. I've done a layer of brown, dark brown, uh, mud, which isn't a very helpful name. Mud. Because, 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 because it's just not a useful name. Because, 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 because. Uh, because. Because of the wonderful things he does. Da, 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 da. <laughs> it's, um, it's a sepia color. It's a very, very dark sepia. And any dark sepia from any pencil set will work just as well. So a dark brown to start building up my background. And it will get even darker after this. And then I did a base layer of purple on the coat and on the hair, and now I'm adding red to the coat. I'm trying to build up brown and purple undertones for pretty much everything in this picture that's outside of the lanterns and the light that the lanterns shine directly onto the object. Now, these lanterns are paper lanterns, so they don't cast a lot of light. They're, they're literally only casting a, like a few inches of light around them, and everything else is quite dark and, and dim. So most of the colors will be very muted and very dark and there will be very little definition on the darker parts of the drawing. Like this part of the dog will be almost entirely in darkness. Okay, I'm using two last colors and I'm adding them to the face. This is a burnt ochre and this is an olive brown. Uh, one is a Prisma color and one is a Black Widow from the skin tone sets. And I'm just going to finish up that shading on the face and we'll be done for today. So the only new colors that I added after the show ended were light green and jade green to the sleeves. And everything else that I used were the same colors that I've already introduced you in the show yesterday and the same colors that we will continue using and building up to complete this coloring. So for my red, I'm using a permanent red from Prismacolor. For my purple, I'm using a dark purple from Prismacolor. And for my dark brown, I'm using mainly mud 
from the Black Widow set, but also a little bit of cinnamon from the Black Widow set. And I'm also using this amazing new chartreuse color that I found from the Lyra set, that's the bright yellow color. And I'm using it for most of my little yellow highlights on this piece. So the main thing that I did, other than introducing the green to the sleeves, was continuing to build up the darkness of this piece. And it's still not even nearly close to how dark we have to get for the light effect to truly be as dramatic as we want it to be. So we're going to keep layering and layering and layering to demonstrate how effective that technique really is. I mean, certainly you could start uh, from a, from the dark color right away and just paint the background black with a little gradient around the lamp. But once you pick up on this technique of just adding a darker color on top of a darker color on top of another color and, and just building up that gradient from your paper color to the darkest tone, uh, your final darkest tone, you will see all the little things that are happening in that one color that's, it's almost like if you zoom in onto a photograph or, or even a painting, you can see all the little pixels that are slightly different colors. It's never one solid color. So that's what we're going for. We're going for things that the human eye can't really perceive, but that are there. Every color is composed of a million little pixels that are all slightly different in color variation. So when you create layers on, on a coloring, you achieve that effect naturally without having to go pixel by pixel, which is why I like it so much. And also, you are in control. You can, you can constantly adjust how dark certain areas are and how light certain areas are. And you can change the, the color, the direction that, that you're taking your, your colors as well. For me, I tend to go towards purple a lot. So I have a chance to take it into a slightly different direction as I'm building up colors instead of, you know, picking one solid color and then being like, oh, well, this looks like a mistake. Maybe I should have used a different color. This kind of a technique spares you from having to make those decisions. Like, oh, what color should I make the background? It's not about color. It's about light and dark, especially with glow effects. So it was really important for us to establish the light and shadows in the beginning. Remember when I did the whole tan paper versus white paper and we established just the shadows and left just the lights white? That was the single most important step in the coloring of this type. Once we have the light and shadow established, everything else literally doesn't matter in terms of color. And today we'll demonstrate it by doing, um, by coloring the rest of our lanterns in different colors to show you that light effects work the same way regardless of the color that you pick. So, um, oh, the other thing that I wanted to tell you guys, that's a nice trick for building up your red tones. Uh, since we're dealing with objects in the dark, well, nearly in the dark, uh, a lot of the questions that I get in terms of colors is, well, how do I make red or, or green or blue or any color look like it's in shadow, look like it's dark? Do I add black? Do I, do I add blue? Like, what kind of a color do I add for red? And in something like this, that's a soft yellow light. Um, well, some, we're going to have some red lights as well, but really warm tones in our light, like natural um, candle glow, fire glow, this kind of a lantern glow that's, that's very soft and warm. Your shadows won't really have a lot of blue in them, but they will have a lot of purple. So for me, I like to build up my red with a deep purple. And that would be this deep purple right here. My very favorite Prismacolor pencil that is actually called Deep Purple. That's PC 930, 931. Um, but it doesn't have to be this exact pencil. Any kind of a deep purple, dark purple will work just as well. You, you know, you know I can't let that go. What? Deep, pur deep purple? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Deep purple is the is the secret weapon, and I'm actually I'm adding this deep purple to everything. Like that's my main shadow color here, but I don't want it to be too um, too saturated and too purple. So I'm I'm diluting this deep purple with my dark brown, and for that I'm using dark sepia or mud. And in the very end, I will also be adding black but I like to add black 
over all the layers that I've already established. That way it's, it's, it really shows the, the depth and, and the darkness that we're trying to achieve. So without further ado, let's start coloring the next lantern. I will show you guys how to make the red ones today. And then on this side, we'll try um, a whole bunch of different other colors, different other colors. There you go. I speak good again. So these are paper lanterns and they're a little bit see-through, but not, not a lot. So we have to imagine that there is a light source in the middle. In this case, it's electrical. So we have an actual little light bulb in the middle and the light bulb will shine through the paper, but not completely through. It will, it will just appear as a little glow in the center. And the, the light of the bulb itself is orange or yellow. So we will see a little bit of that yellow orange glow in the center. And of course the paper lanterns themselves as well have a little bit of yellow to them because of the natural color of the paper before they were dyed red. So all these things you have to consider. And also remember that they're not very bright lights. Like these aren't like Christmas lights. The whole beauty of paper lanterns is that they're kind of delicate and they barely cast any light at all. Like you can, you can comfortably look at a paper lantern and it doesn't hurt your eyes. I tend to pick a whole bunch of colors ahead of time and just have them laying here next to me. I've already picked out a whole bunch of colors. I may use some of them. Um, I may not use some of them, but this is my main red that I selected. And once again, I can't stress this enough, you guys, like my channel is never about matching colors. Like if you don't have a permanent red, it absolutely doesn't matter. First of all, there are like three other red colors in the Prisma color set that are nearly identical. And depending on how much pressure you apply to the page, depending on the exact type of paper that you're using or the ink in your printer, even that you use to print this page, all of these things will come together to create an effect that's very specifically yours. So you can, you can use every single exact pencil that I use and your coloring will come out completely different. So try to chase the effect, not the tool. As long as you have a red that's like a bright red, like a lipstick red, go with that. I will keep announcing my colors just for science and for reference and so that it's on record which colors I'm using. Um, but please don't think that you need to have that exact pencil for this, for this to work. Any kind of red will work. The important part is to apply more red to the edges and to make it fully saturated, never with pressure though, always with more pigment and less to the center. We're trying to make this round glowing gradient with the center remaining white and the edges being brighter. And I'm also going over these parallel horizontal lines that are the ribs of the, of the lantern, making them red as well. Oh, I've been working with this ridiculous outrageous neon orange that I suddenly really like. I think for this, it's perfect because we're dealing with lanterns that are, that are glowing and that are festive and perfectly red and have this orange glow in the center. So this kind of a neon color is, is actually kind of perfect. I can't imagine where else I would use something like this. Certainly not in any realistic coloring, um, but for something like this, it's perfect. Um, but what am I going to say? It doesn't have to be a neon orange pencil. It can be absolutely any shade of orange. You can make it brighter by adding a bright yellow over it. That's always a good trick to have up your sleeve. And actually you don't even need to use orange. You can go straight from red to yellow and that will naturally create an orange color as, as the gradient. So experiment, see what works. Um, print out a whole bunch of these and try to color every lantern with a slightly different technique and see which one comes out better, which one you find to be more interesting and more fun, which pencils you like to work with. For instance, I know the pencils whose texture I prefer over others. Like even in the same set, every pencil is a little bit different. Like even though they're all from the same brand, everyone has its own personality. Some are a little bit harder, some are a little bit softer. Like you, you know your pencils after you work with them long enough. And now I just add yellow and there you go, a red lantern. Let's make another one and then we'll move on to this part over here to try out different colors. Another yellow now. I'm, I'm looking for something that's not as lemon yellow as this. 
and not as orange as this right here. So I'm looking for like a, like an egg yolk yellow. And this is what I found. This is called sunburst yellow and it's PC 917. Um, but again, any other yellow will work just fine. And if it's too lemony, add a little bit of orange to balance it out. If it's too orange, apply it lightly and then add some more yellow to it. So I'm going to use this, uh, I already forgot what it's called, sunburst yellow around my lanterns as the glow. So I, I hope you guys are starting to see a pattern here with what I'm doing. Regardless of the color that I'm using, the pattern is I am picking my brighter version of that color, the, the more saturated version of that color and adding it to the edges. So in case of orange, my, my brightest orange is all around the edges and I'm leaving the center kind of glowing by not adding that much color. Same thing with, with green. Uh, this is a very pale green, so I don't want super strong contrast here. Again, this is paper, so it's mostly translucent. Um, so we don't have that much of a, of a color gradient, but with red, we get a stronger gradient just because of the nature of the color. With the red lanterns, the light sh shines through it and it looks quite orange. So with red, again, more red at the edges, no red at all in the center, and then fill it in with orange and yellow, more yellow to the center. I wouldn't leave any white here at all. I would just color everything with, uh, with my colors just because we're dealing with paper lanterns. The, they don't cast white light. They cast very diffused, colorful light. Mostly yellow, regardless of the color of the paper, the glow itself will be mostly yellow. So you may ask why we did all this work with white charcoal if we're coloring it all with with pencils and that's for the purity of saturation because the paper is toned a lot of the colors will get slightly distorted when applied over the paper and with darker colors that's a plus we want them to be a little bit more muffled a little bit more diffused a little bit darker but with lighter colors and with colors that we want to be purely saturated like these lights we don't want the background the paper color to mess with our actual desired color. So we whitewashed it so that we can add um, the pure colors on top of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I continued. <laughs> I continued with the lights on the right. We did all three colors together. I showed you how to do green red and this orange yellow color and the principle is the same if you remember from last week the thing with the glowing lanterns the the little round ones in the back and the square ones on the side our strategy was to add darker not darker but stronger pigment around the edges and leave the centers a little bit lighter so that we can add our yellow glow afterwards in the beginning we created all of these lanterns with white charcoal so that the white primed um, those areas for pure, pure, clean colors at the end. And now it's paying off. You can see that the yellow is really, truly saturated yellow, and it's even lighter than the actual paper color. And that right there is one of the main magical tricks in glow effects for me. I tend to work on tan tone paper, and I think it's a really strong effect for glow effects. If you can make the light even lighter than the paper itself, that really sells the illusion of glow. So after I finished the lanterns, I moved on to the puppy dog, but I was in for a surprise because I couldn't just color the puppy dog with all the colors that I wanted to jump into right away. This part that you're watching right now, me establishing the shadows on the puppy dog and on the wall behind him and all around that, that round window, this part of establishing the brown shadows took nearly two hours. So I sped it up a lot and we're gonna skip through a whole part of the, of the shadow creation, but it was, it was quite um, systematic and therapeutic and you kind of get in the zone and just keep shading and shading and shading and shading. It would definitely not make for a good live show because <laughs> it's, it's quite boring to watch. 
um, but it, but in real life, the experience of it is I find it to be very soothing. You just you don't realize how much time goes by. The only reason that I know how much time goes by is because I record them and I see the timestamps on my video. And I was like, really? I spend two hours on this? That's crazy. Uh, if you don't find this kind of a pencil coloring shading technique uh, soothing, if instead you find it frustrating and you would rather work on the lights and the details, I highly recommend that you try um, something faster for creating the shadows like watercolor paint. With watercolors, I could have created those shadows in a matter of minutes. But again, I really like the process, so I took the time to establish the shadows before moving on to my jade green. All the colors that you see on this coloring page are really the same set of colors. I don't have that many here. I don't I don't like to have the box of pencils next to me so that I get distracted by, by different types of green. Like I've pre-selected my jade green and uh, the darker version of it, which is one of my aquamarine blue colors for the, for the slightly darker bit on the jade. And that's it, no other greens at all. For my yellows, I only had two yellow tones. For my red, I had two red tones. For my orange, I had that crazy neon orange. And after the video, I will actually show you all these pencils and call out their names if you guys are interested. For the purple, I also had two tones. That, that seems to be a, a pattern with me. I didn't even realize that I have two versions of every color, just so that there's a little bit of depth to every single one of them. I went with um, Prismacolor Red, and I found after a while that it just wasn't strong enough. So the red that I'm adding um, later on is actually a Black Widow red. I think it's Blood Red or True Red, but it's one of the reds from the original, or it might be Ladybug. I'm not sure. I'll have to find it in my, in my pile of pencils and give you the exact name. But it's one of the true reds in the original Black Widow set that I found to be a lot stronger than the Prismacolor reds. I was very surprised by that. But that goes to show again that it's better to just try things out, try what works, and adjust to the effect that you're going for. The red looked fine by itself until I added all the dark shadows and the bright yellow glow. And between the high contrast and the really bright yellow glow, the red just kind of dimmed and didn't, didn't look exciting enough. So I had to step up my game with the red and find something brighter. And for the, for the little red ears on the, on the puppy dog dragon costume, I even added a little bit of a red marker for it to be the red marker that I'm using right now, that calligraphy pen. I went over the uh, some of the red on the rest of the coloring page with that as well, just so that it will pop. So nothing new, all the same strategies, same shading techniques, same brown shadows in two or three tones of brown, plus the dark purple, um, going over the areas that we established in the very beginning that were white. I've colored everything that we had white with a lemon yellow. The only part on this whole painting that's left nearly white is the part in the center of the main lantern because that's our, that's our centerpiece and it's also the biggest source of light. And by contrast, it looks like it's glowing more than everything else around it. So there you have it. Oh. Okay. <laughs>